Welcome to another edition of the In Search SEO Podcast, where we paint the town red with search marketing insights. Really important guest to talk about a really important issue with you. Kelly Stanzi is here to talk mental health in the SEO sphere, how to create a work-life balance, how to deal with the demands of an SEO life while struggling internally, and what needs to change in the SEO world for there to be better mental health environments for us. I am your host, Morty Oberstein, and I am joined by Sapir Carabello. Hi, Morty. So in Kate, hi, Sapir. I'm sorry. I should have said hi first. Hi, Sapir. Hi, Morty. (laughs) How's everything? It's good. How are you? I'm okay. Yeah? Yes. That's good. Your episode last week with my birthday was a little bit over the top for me, but <laughs> I'm over Sorry it. Sorry about that. That's okay. <laughs> last time I tell you when it's my birthday. <laughs> Good. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, in case you can't tell, we are taking a bit of a different tone today because if you case you, your first episode tuning in, thank you for joining us. Yeah. Um, usually it gets a bit crazy here, but because we have a really serious issue on the table. And it would be a really jerk face thing to do to run through the show with our usual shenanigans. Right. We're going to, you know, pull it back a little bit, but be back in full force next week. Do not doubt. Looking forward. Yes. Quick reminder, we put out a new episode of the In Search SEO podcast each and every Tuesday. It's on the Rank Ranger blog. It's on Stitcher. It's on Spotify. It's on SoundCloud. And you can subscribe on iTunes. Okay, so I'm not going to go full promo on you today um, because, again, very serious issue on the table. Don't kind of feel it matches the tone. Just a quick reminder, um, you can head over to rankranger.com, sign up for a 14-day free trial, no credit card needed because we are not spammy at all, um, and just you know, sign up for a uh, free trial, 14 days free, no credit card needed, or you can schedule a demo, get a tour of Rank Ranger from one of our hyper-qualified Account representatives. Um, Okay. So I have a lot of data to share with you. I have data on rank stability in 2020. I have data on what features are competing with featured snippets for user attention. And hopefully we'll start to get to that next week. Um, Unless something like, you know, crazy happens, like another core update, in which case we'll deal with that. But all things being equal, we'll get to that data next week. Because again, I I didn't want to take away with a very serious issue on the table. And I didn't want to take away from that by focusing on a bunch of cool data. Mm-hmm. Let's give this issue what it needs, the attention it needs, the attention it deserves, and we'll deal with the data next week. So look forward to next week. Yeah. Yeah, keeping with suspense a little bit. Okay. Let me get into why we're covering this. So, uh, this, this will be our opening segment, I guess. We're covering mental health in the SEO industry. You know, how SEO has to deal with mental health issues, how to deal with mental health issues, working as an SEO, and the unique um, concerns and conditions that come up be because of that. Okay. So for the most part, you know, when I have a guest on the show, I usually let them pick whatever topic they want, for the most part, right? I ask them, hey, you're coming on the show, so glad you agreed. What do you want to talk about? Because it makes no sense, obviously, for them to talk about something that... It's not really up the rally. Right. So when um, Kelly said she wanted to come on the show and she wanted to discuss mental health and working in the world of, of SEO, I jumped at the chance for a few reasons and I'd like to share those reasons with you, if you'll indulge me. Um, one is, as you'll soon hear, Kelly is an amazingly strong person who um, has her own story to tell and she's incredibly, incredibly brave for being open to sharing that story. So that, in and of itself, her story deserves to be shared and deserves to be given the, uh, the credit that's due to it. Mm-hmm. Two, I wanted to take the stigma, or I wanted to at least um, work towards taking the stigma of mental health issues out of the equation. Okay, for starters, we all have mental health issues. To quote the great Jim Morrison, no one here gets out alive. Also... We, uh, and this is important to me because it's an important like nuance. That I don't think we we um, we recognize enough. Everyone faces moments of challenge that challenge our sanity. Um, and, and you may think, oh, I, I come home. I come from a, you know the perfect family, 
the perfect environment. There's nothing, there's no reason for me to be concerned with mental health issues. But you really never know what life will give you, right? I mean, things come up all the time. When dealing in the workplace, things can get complicated. Things can get stressful. Um, You can lose a job. That's stressful. You can be stuck in one that you don't like, that's maybe abusive in a certain way. And I have been in abusive jobs before. Um, Not to call out Baltimore City Public School System, but that was an abusive job. That challenged my mental sanity in a major way. So you never know. Like You may think, you know, like, you're in the clear. I'm in the clear. But you doesn't. That doesn't mean you always will be. Am I scaring you, by the way, Sapir? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it's not the usual lightweighted, you know, atmosphere that we have. But I think it's an important issue. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I appreciate your support. Welcome. Um, and the last reason that I wanted to bring this up on the podcast is it's a little bit personal for me. So I know I joke a lot. I, I, I mean a lot about my family on the podcast, like often, yeah. any chance I get, right. basically. Um, but you have to understand something about me is that the joking and the dark humor, it's my way of dealing with the fact that I have family members that do suffer from mental illness uh, to this day. And of course, being raised in that environment is was a massive struggle. So the topic really speaks to me personally. And I wanted to address something uh, or this in a serious way. And I'm going to be serious for a change, as you can tell. And it's also very hard for me. Um, But we're going to do it. You know, I'm actually, I'm all for it. And I think it's actually great and really admirable that you're using your platform, this podcast, to bring up this issue. And I really hope that it can help and console people that are listening, who are dealing with it. So, yeah, definitely. Good job, Marty. (coughs) Suck up. Anyway. (laughs) I had to throw one joke in there. Okay. okay. With that, with a little intro out of the way, that's all you're going to get for us today. This uh, We'll look at the recorder here. It's about eight minutes or so, which is like half our usual opening segment. That's all you're getting because we are ready to hear what Kelly has to say. So here's Kelly Stanzi on mental health and SEO. Cut one. Welcome to another In Search SEO podcast interview exclusive. Today we have an industry author with us. You can find her as part of Search Engine Journal's biggest SEO trends of 2020, according to 58 experts. She is currently doing e-commerce operations for Nickel and Suede. She is Kelly Stanzi. How are you? Great. How are you doing? I am great. So I have to ask, we've been trying to do this interview for a while, and between both of our offspring, it's, it's been hard. How is how is the, <laughs> how is the winter been treating you with your children or child rather? Uh, well, we're we're in the Midwest, so we have pretty hectic winters, anyways. But our poor little man has chronic ear infections, so we're actually getting tubes done tomorrow. Oof. Yeah, um, I'm anxious because I know he's going to be really uncomfortable through you know anesthesia and everything. But at the same time, I'm ready. For him to have some relief on that front. Um, other than that, you know, my husband also works in digital. So we've had a lot of, like, snow days at home, which has been great. <laughs> That's nice. That's cozy. Um, it's, yeah. Yeah. So it's it's funny. We haven't really had a, a really snowy winter in several years. And then this year popped up, and we've spent it snuggled next to the fireplace working on our respective jobs. <laughs> <laughs> That's the best part. It's the best part of the modern world is that you can work at home. I love it. I love working at home. Absolutely. It's the best. I could sit barefoot and no one even knows. I'm not wearing shoes right now. And no one knows. But Well, now everybody knows. But no one did know until now. Yes. Right. There's There's been snow days where I just spent the whole day in my pajamas. Right. And I have no shame about that. <laughs> I, I know someone whose greatest claim to fame is that he, he's able – he works from home. And he's figured it out where he's set himself up to be able to eat in bed and work in bed efficiently. <laughs> it's like, I, 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 don't, I don't know how it's, it is. There should be some kind of award for that. It's amazing. That is inc- That's my dream that is somehow to do that. Impressive. Incredibly impressive. There's, yeah. Again, amazing. Okay. So we're going to talk about 
um, work and life balance and mental health in the SEO industry. And this is a little bit more of a serious take on uh, of a topic than we usually focus on. For example, for our regular listeners, we usually do a bit called optimize it or disavow it. It's a fun little game we play at the end of the the interview, we're going to forego that today because I don't really feel fun and games is so appropriate for the conversation. So if you're wondering, hey, let's do every, this podcast every week and where did that segment go? It'll be back next week, so don't worry. Just to sort of get us started with this, um, the conversation about work-life balance, mental health in the SEO industry, why do you think that's an important conversation to have, particularly for well, SEO? Yeah, well, I think... To start off with, it's just an important conversation in any industry. That's true. Uh, you know, conversations about mental health are incredibly stigmatized. And I think in a very ambiguous trade like SEO, where, you know, we joke that the, the standard answer to any question is it depends. depends. You know, if you maybe aren't operating at 100% or your brain is functioning and processing things a little bit differently than what people would consider typical, uh, that ambiguity can be hard and it's compounded by the fact that most SEOs are on call 24-7. If a site goes down, you have to be there. If uh, Google rolls out uh, an algorithm update while you're on vacation, sometimes you got to plug in. So I think the, the combination of unpredictability and um, lack of, of immediate like hands-on control, that can definitely create additional stress. That said, it also tends to attract some really creative, brilliant people, which also tends to go hand-in-hand hand with a heightened risk for mental illness. You get these incredible, amazing minds that can look at things from a different angle and use both halves of the, the, the brain really actively. But they also, you know, have to work through some other difficulties. And, you know, I have anxiety and depression. I have for my entire adult life. I'm really open about it. But at the same time, there have been days where, you know, being a, a ship on Google Sea has definitely taken a harder toll on me because. I was working with something else kind of not necessarily pulling me back because I'm actually really grateful for my journey, but definitely, definitely adding a little extra weight to what my career was, was bringing. And um, you know, before, before I, we dive into that, there's a lot to sort of unpack there. I just want to say that one, thank you for sharing that. And, and two, the, the questions that I asked for the audience listening, um, I just want to Put a little backstory to it. I I joke on the podcast every once in a while that I've had a you know horrible traumatic childhood, and while I joke about that, it's actually true. Um, so some of the questions I'm going to be asking are coming from my own personal experience, and I'm interested about um, particularly about de- working with um, in SEO and something technical and something creative at the same time. Coming in with sort of having a um, I, I'll call it a burden on you because I all I I'm I'm interested in how you deal with that because I have a um I have a son who's eight years old who's on the autistic spectrum and one of the worries that I have, of course, as a parent going you know going forward is, what's his life going to be like as he gets older when when he has to work, how is he going to be able to sort of handle that additional hardship and the regular normal stress of a job and I'm wondering how have you been able to handle that because it's a lot. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I have the same thoughts because we understand that a lot of mental illness predispositions can be genetic, um, but they, they also can be completely situational. And in the case of like my son, there's a combination of both trauma-based situational and then genetic factors in our family. So there's a lot of me that worries about this pretty regularly, like, you know, when does normal childhood angst start being early indicators of maybe inheriting something? Mm-hmm. Or, you know, how do I break the cycle of trauma? Because that's a very real thing. Um, and ultimately, you know, he's got two parents that work in digital. My husband is a paid strategist. And he is, uh, you know, also in a pretty pretty high pressure situation he's agency side still so jameson's going to see you know two parents that have pretty intense careers 
but also try and prioritize self-care and family and work-life balance. So I'm hoping just as long as we can raise him to be confident and capable and humble enough to ask for help when he needs it, that we can stay ahead of whatever he'll end up having to deal with. That's a really good point. Um, and, you know, speaking to the people out there who already have families or, or will have families, I'm, I'm currently recording this podcast. It's 745 at night. Um, you know, I, I often get I often do this. I'm, I'm in Israel, so I'm ahead of most people. Um, seven hours on the East Coast, uh, 10 hours on the West Coast of the U.S. And my kids see me getting ready for an interview. And they're, they, they've made comments to my, to my wife, like, why does daddy have to work so much? And it, you may not think they notice or you may not think that they care. And they may not be very vocal or verbal about it. But kids definitely do notice and your work-life balance definitely does take a toll. I'll give you an example. Um, I have eight-year-old twins and um, one of them was having an issue with one of his teachers. Um, ironically, it was the the younger male teacher that he was having a problem with. And what we sort of figured out was that it was during a time where I was super busy and there's a lot going on. And it wasn't so much stressed out, but I really wasn't paying attention to him enough as I should have. And he's very, very sensitive to begin with. And once we realized that and I was able to even just a few minutes, I'm talking five minutes where I was like, it's time to focus on that child has made an incredible difference in his behavior and his outlook and his level of happiness. And you would think that there's, you know, he doesn't, he doesn't care that I'm so busy. It doesn't really make a difference. He seems fine. It all, it all, all that those small little details, all that work-life balancing that seems so cliche actually in reality does make a big difference. Oh, absolutely. And there's a few things that I kind of treat as being sacred in our work-life balance in our family. So Josh and I both use Slack at work. So, you know, my husband and I have the the capability of being completely connected at all times. And ultimately, it's up to us to to be accountable to to sever that tie every now and then. So I always try to make a point to not have my phone on me while we're eating dinner together as a family. Um, Jameson, at the time of recording, he's 14 months, so it's a really fun time. He's trying out a lot of new foods. He's learning how to use utensils. It's just a really, really special experience to have to share a meal where, like, he's able to eat a lot of the same foods we are now, and I cook family dinner for all of us. But then I also, even like, even when there's fires going on at work, I do bedtime with him every night, unless I have, you know, a pre-scheduled reason why I'm not home. So from about seven to eight, that is family time. I am snuggling and we're reading and we're we're, you know, giggling and cuddling, and then I give him his last bottle, and he goes to bed. After 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 lots of screaming, or or he goes to bed. No, he's actually he he goes down very well. God bless. Um, we're very fortunate. God bless. He, yeah, yeah, he goes down really well for bedtime, but he does not nap all during the day. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. So we'll we'll take one. Um. So yeah, he goes down really well, but then like eight o'clock rolls around, I come out of his room and sometimes I'm opening up my computer and going right back to it, but I never want to violate that sense of like safety and routine that he has any more than is helpful for him. Because I'm a big believer in like breaking up the ordinary, but like it's got to be a balance of routine and adventure. And in this case, for us, routine means we eat dinner as a family as we're all home, and then I do bedtime. Aside from that, my husband and I just do the juggling act of, all right, someone's got to cook, or, you know, I've got to hop on a late night call, or I've got to push changes to my campaigns on my site um, at an off hour. So do you want to take dinner tonight, and I'll play with him, and then we'll swap off, or it's, it's definitely a balancing act, but the thing is, like, this job actually probably has the most hectic schedule of any I've had before, but I love it. And it's so fun and fulfilling that, you know, it's, it's worth it to, to have to put in the extra work to balance it all. Yeah. And it, it, it's hard to having that hour, right. I'm, I'll tell you first personally. So I'm, I'm a reserved Jew, so I keep Sabbath. So for 25 hours, I don't look at the phone. I don't look at the computer and, 
it's fantastic. It's great. And sometimes, but sometimes it's hard. It's almost like anxiety. But I'm like, something's going on on Twitter, and I have to just sort of stop. And I, it's like, I know it's really hard. Or it's dinner yeah. time, and something's going on. And social media is the worst. It's the best, and it's the worst. It's almost addictive, whether it be work, whether it be checking your email, checking this, checking that. How's, how's my podcast doing? How many people listened to it in the last hour? There's so many things going on, and it's almost addictive. And taking that hour break or, or 45 minute break or three day break, whatever it is, it's harder than it actually sounds. Yep, agreed. And what's tricky is like there's actually hard science out there about what your brain does when you're, you know, getting a little lift from social media. All right, you pop in, you interact with someone, you get a serotonin or oxytocin um, boost. Like, there's there's legitimate like neurotransmitter reactions to engaging with social media or even like work related channels like oh you see an email you're excited to get because of a project like cool that's a highly addictive substance right there um, but I think creating some level of of downtime and, and boundaries and, and separation is so important and honestly I wish I would have had the clarity to do it a little sooner because up until I became a mother, like my career was my life. And then, you know, this wonderful little human that I made entered my world. And it's like, wait, no, like my career pays for everything that happens outside of it. And it can be crazy and fulfilling and a big part of my identity and a big piece of who I am. And even a part of our family culture, because again, like my husband and I both live this life but it isn't everything and ultimately at the end of the day it's a job that pays for the life i love outside of work and the part of the life i love right i mean that's what all comes down to do you do you live to work or work to live i mean there is obviously you know an existential um fulfillment in working but the the end of the day they and it is hard especially in our culture it is not you fundamentally and it but actually um it kind of slapped me in the face a little bit the first time I ever got laid off. I actually moved to Kansas City from Illinois, worked and lived here for 14 months, and then the company that moved me 500 miles from everything I knew laid me off. And Ouch. by then, I had a few friends in the area, and I had actually met my now husband. So I had some roots put down, but... I mean, I was 23 years old. I was convinced that I was going to completely just knock the socks off the digital strategy world. Like, I was supposed to be a big deal. And here I was unemployed <laughs> in a strange city. Like, okay, yeah, your job's not that important. <laughs> but, you know, didn't really necessarily learn from from that until Jameson joined <laughs> us on the outside and, like, okay, like, I want to leave work early for once in my life because actually I want to go play with my baby because he's amazing and he's so fun and I want his snuggles and, you know, my husband and I joke about how, you know, we go to work and, you know, we haven't seen him for an hour and we'll text each other and say we miss him. Like, That's cute. That's really cute. When when you have four, it's sort of, that sort of dissipates after a while. Like, I just need a break. But yeah, with one, I get that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're we're still, I think, in the honeymoon period. That's right. Parenting. Um, Although he's been awake at 4 a.m. every morning this week. So I don't know how much longer the honeymoon period is going to last. Can can I tell you the best story ever? When we had our, we started off with twins. So I don't know what, I don't know what having one is like altogether. Um. But when we had our fourth um, and our last, so I got back from the hospital at 4.30 in the morning. And just as I walk in the door, number three woke up. I'm like, oh, my God, this is insane. Like, that's that's like Murphy's Law. Like, that cannot be. Like, it's 4.30 in the morning. <laughs> Why are you awake? And, oh, my God, when am I going to sleep? There, There is a tremendous amount of vulnerability, I think, in, in, in life. You, in, in, you, you think you're going to go to another city and you're going to, you know, become a, a, a digital marketing rock star and, and, you know, grow and fulfill yourself and, and then you lose your job. And I, I think there's a, either, I find, I mean, just me personally, that either people deny the vulnerability or go too far with the, the vulnerability. 
and it's a hard line to, to be like, okay, I am vulnerable. My life can change on a dime. You never know what's going to happen and still be secure at the same at the same time. And it's very, very hard. Um, I'm wondering if it's okay with you. Um, and if it's not, that's obviously okay. I'm wondering if we can maybe dive into some of your um, your, your story a little bit. Because I find personally that being able to share how you've dealt with hardships is a great way to help other people do the same. I have a younger sister, so we were sort of in the same boat growing up. And for her, my experiences and how I've dealt with them have, have helped her. So in the in the spirit of maybe helping some people out there who are listening to this podcast, who are in SEO and dealing with all the pressure of SEO and are having a hard time, would it be okay to sort of dive into how you've handled that? Yeah, absolutely. I think my, my biggest advice is Find an inner circle because I have been the pendulum where I didn't let anyone in and didn't have anyone to really lean on, but I've also let way too many people in and wore my heart on my sleeve. And the reality is there's a, there's a happy medium. And what's ended up working for me is having a few core people that are like my rocks. They are the pillars that my well-being is built on because I always know that Either they'll call me out when I'm clearly not doing well or when I'm self-aware and know that I need to talk to someone, they're there. Um, So that's kind of like on the the personal family, friends front. But then also get a good medical team lined up. Like (laughs) it sounds so clinical when I say it like that, but like I've seen psychiatrists, I've seen plenty of therapists and I'm at a place right now where I don't have to regularly check in with a psychiatrist. I don't have to go to therapy regularly. My PCP is amazing. He's absolutely outstanding. But at the same time, like, he kind of keeps an eye on me, too. I actually just had my annual physical with him, and he stared me down, like, totally blunt, and was like, okay, how's your mental health going? And knowing that that's, that I'm not going to, like, get away with not talking about that, even at a totally normal doctor's appointment is almost refreshing. It takes the onus off of me having to initiate because that's what he's there for. He's there to help take care of my health, and that includes what my brain is doing. And he's also the first one to offer to refer me to someone who specializes because he recognizes the, the limitations of his expertise. He's a whole person. Sometimes what you need is someone who specializes in the hard stuff that has to do with your brain and your history and your trauma. Another thing that has really helped me is fitness. I'm not actually currently doing it right now because postpartum life, my body's just a hot mess. Um, But for a long time, I used running as a tool to really keep track of of my well-being. develop a, a stronger sense of self-awareness. So when I graduated from college, I was actually newly in recovery for an eating disorder. I had uh, bulimic tendencies, food addiction. I was a binge eater, essentially. Um, and over the course of the next two to three years, I started doing 5Ks. And then uh, um, all of that culminated in the year before I got married, I ran 12 races in 12 months and four of them were half marathons. Wow. Like it was incredible. And w- I think one of the, the biggest uh, contributors to me really getting to know myself better because one, you spend a lot of time running and alone in your own head. And two, you just learn how to listen to yourself better when you're putting your body under that kind of pressure. Uh, from there, I think really finding any way to be self-aware as to how you're doing, how your struggles might be translating to your behaviors, Um, whether that's meditation, whether that's journaling, whether that's, um, you know, some other form of self-reflection, anything that you can do that makes you sit and think, okay, what am I feeling? Is it valid or is it my brain lying to me because my neurotransmitters are off? Um, How is that then translating to my behavior? Am I 
acting out or behaving inappropriately or my withdrawing onto myself and distancing myself from people are my behaviors indicative of maybe not feeling like myself or needing a little extra TLC. It's just a, a lot of really understanding like how you behave when you're healthy, how you behave when you're not, and what that gray area looks like to identify when you're in a bad place. So typically, if you're going downward, like people don't tend to really, unless there's a, a diagnosed medical condition that causes it, don't tend to crash really fast. In my experience, if you're living with a, a chronic illness, it's a long, slow decline, and you don't always realize how deep you are until like you have a big epiphany and you're at rock bottom or someone calls you out on it. So you can kind of help away way like, getting to that point and catching it earlier by developing those the self awareness skills. Yeah, I'm 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 a million percent with you with the self awareness thing and, and it, just speaking for my own life and what it's it's hard because we're geared up one, it either I found, and you can disagree with me, just my personal out, um, outlook, there are people who are more inclined to be self-aware and people who are less inclined to be self-aware of themselves. And that makes it hard to, just for certain people off off the cuff or, or from the start. But then you're living in a society where everything is quick, on the move, on the go, one thing after the next. And where do you find time to – you mean you're living in, in a binge culture, right? You do your work, you whatever, and then you binge Netflix for the next three hours five hours, six hours, whatever yeah. it is, where is that time to sort of say, okay, stop, quiet, I need to think, what's going on with me, why am I doing this, um, what, what's really motivating me here, what, what, you know, symbolically, what's the represent of my life, and, and so forth, and that's re it's really, it's very hard, and I think maybe the first step is to realize that maybe I'm not as self-aware as I think I am, and how do I go about being more self-aware, whether it's just you, something internally that you do or some help that you seek. Uh, you mentioned the doctor, by the way. I'll speak from personal experience with my own son. Our, our, um, our physician, our family physician, was the catalyst for getting a diagnosis for my son. It was very hard to figure out what was the issue, what's not the issue, what's going on. Is this ADHD? Is it this thing? Is it that thing? And our doctor was the place where we started and who put us on the path towards getting a clearer, because nothing is clear, but clearer sort of sort of outlook. Um, I want to I, I want to ask you. I think you mentioned this before earlier. It's not all bad. There's you have these things, these struggles that that happen to you, whether it be from growing up or whether whether it be getting fired from a job or whether it be stress or whatever it is. And overcoming that and dealing with that sort of, I find, makes you who you are, makes you a deeper person and makes you a more, um, for me, a spiritual person or a more reflective person. And it's something that you can run with, something you can take in, something you can go with, something that becomes a positive part of your life. Have you found the same sort of thing? Yeah, absolutely. Like, most of the good things I have in my life right now, I can almost directly attribute to difficult times. So, like, this, this series of dominoes that led me to the life I love, like, a lot of it started with a really ugly, bad relationship ending in college. And, you know, suddenly my high school sweetheart and my hometown didn't really feel like home anymore. And I felt like I needed to do something drastic. So I started taking these out-of-state internships, and I traveled, and I focus on my career and obviously my pendulum swung a little too hard into the career for a while but those internships led to the job offer in Kansas City and I moved down here and I was alone and really had to stretch my comfort zone and then I met Josh and all of a sudden like my career changes drastically that's actually how I got into SEO I would not have probably gotten a job in a specialization that I absolutely loved if I hadn't lost the other job in the first place. So like that bad relationship in college ending led me to Kansas City. Losing the job led me to SEO. Um, and now I have this home and this family that I adore and this career that has taken so many bends in the road but been so just like exciting and adventurous and fulfilling. 
and none of it would have happened without the Big Dad surprises. And they may have knocked the wind out of me at the beginning, but I'm grateful for the way they've led me to who I am today and where I'm at, simply because, like, I can't, this is the only life I can imagine for myself. I can't fabricate another one. And I might as well appreciate the one I have because it's actually pretty cool, even if there have been rough spots along the way. It's almost as if life is not, I mean, poetic as it sounds, life is not about, you know, reaching trouble points and hurdles and asking why, why did this happen to me? Um, why is my life like this? It's about not asking why and redeeming the situation to the best of the, your your capabilities, however you can to take whatever you have and turn it into something better or, or good. Yeah. To sort of come full circle, let's bring this back to um, to SEO for for a second. Um, I'm wondering because you are obviously someone who's tuned into this uh, on a scale of one to ten. Um, how well do you think the average SEO professional balances their work and uh, personal home life? Um, one being the lowest. Yeah, one being the lowest. Being yeah, best. ten being the yeah ten being the okay. best, most balanced. <laughs> Um, I would argue that probably most of the, and this is going to change depending on where you are, uh, most of them are probably at like a three. (laughs) That's bad. Wow. Yeah. Yep. I mean, that's that's my personal experience. So a little bit of color context. Um, At my job prior to this one, I was the only SEO strategist for the entire Hallmark Corporation. My primary role was e-commerce and helping run hallmark.com but i also consulted on things like content strategy many sites for other subsidiaries um there was there was just way too much work for for one person and i did my best to prioritize what i could but at the same time like there were always going to be midnight conference calls that i'd have to hop on with our offshore team or um, nights that I had to work late simply because there weren't enough hours in the day. How do you deal before with that? Before that, but, uh, you, I don't mean to interrupt you, but you know, I've been in situations like this before, whether it be an SEO or not an SEO, and it, it's hard because you feel like, well, this is the expectation. I have to do this. If I don't do this, maybe I will get fired. How do you create that balance in a pressure situation like that? For me, the balance was really understanding that, like, there are trade-offs, like taking top time when I've had to do overnight conference calls or, you know, I had to work a bunch over the weekend, so maybe I just don't go in on Monday or something like that. A lot of it depends on your team and your culture. I was fortunate that even though I had to work a lot of weird hours, for the most part, people were pretty understanding about, okay, you know, Kelly spent six hours online overnight last night because the website pushed didn't go as expected. So maybe she doesn't come in this morning. But at the same time, like it was a lot. And there were, you know, expectations in that role that I knew were never probably going to change in the foreseeable future. So that was part of why I started considering, you know, maybe a change is, is what I mean. And I ended up here. And, you know, I'm the, the only digital strategist in a retail company that does most of their revenue online. So it's busy and it's hectic, but it's a different kind of busy and hectic. It's a startup versus kind of the corporate grind. So my other piece of advice on that is you're probably always going to be busy and stressed out. If you work in a trade, find the busy and stressed out that fits you. Mm, I like that. I'm personally speaking, I used to work in property management and it was a very, it was one of those jobs where you ever get calls in the middle of the night. Oh, there's no heat in this building. And I was working for a company that was, it was good. Um, I, I There was a sort of expectation, like no matter what it has to get done, which is unrealistic because it just, it, I, I just can't. Um, I will say yeah. that working where I am now, kudos to Rank Ranger, I have a ton on my plate. I'm doing an interview with 8, 8, 15 at night. I have a massive amount of, of things on my plate. But we do have a really nice culture where I can say, okay, we want to do X, Y, and Z. I can't. Like I will put it on my list and I will figure it out somehow and I will get to it at some point, some way, somehow, and we'll we'll do it because it's important and I want to do it. But I, I just can't because I just have so much on my plate and there's an there's an understanding, yeah, okay, we under we understand. Like that makes total sense. How could you do it otherwise? And I think 
know, there, there's so much that goes into, um, and, I'll, and I'll say this at the risk of sounding like a like a jerk, but there's a lot of people out there who think they're like experts in in you know, um, you're you're doing enterprise SEO. I'll tell you how to manage your team. Put more work on them, to give them double loads, and the, the the ones who will do the best job, the ones you want to keep on your team, they'll rise to the occasion and blah, blah, whatever, whatever, whatever. And that's just ridiculous. And that's insane and stupid. You shouldn't do that because people are not horses. People are people. And most people, I find at least because I'm a trusting person, despite my cynicism, will tell you and it, that I just can't do X, Y, and Z. And they legitimately can't do X, Y, and Z. And it's not a matter they're trying to get out of their work or anything like that. And I, I think there has to be on both sides from the you know, management versus the, you know, the, the, the crew, the team, to trusting and communicating and accepting limitations. And it's okay to say no. And if, it's, and if they don't accept no, then maybe it's time to move on. Yep. Yep, and I'm I'm a big believer in trust being an indicator um, of the the health of a team. If you don't feel comfortable telling a superior that you do not have the bandwidth to do something, or that you need to deprioritize one thing because another thing has come up and it's more important, that's not a good environment. No, that's to be really in. bad. Like that's really bad because um, you're stuck. And yeah, yeah, you're if you if you feel stuck, like think about the the ways you can impact the culture because I'm one of the, I'm an idealist. I want to go in and fix things and I'm going to make it better. And the reality is like, it's not my job to make it better for everyone else. Mm -hmm. It's my job to know how to do my job. And if I can contribute to a positive culture, I will, but I'm, I'm probably going to use this word a bajillion times throughout the course of this interview, but Balance is important, and you have to balance what positive influence you can have yeah. with the well-being that you need. And sometimes, you know, a team culture or a specific role, the positive you bring and the positive you create around you does not outweigh the negatives and the strain that it's placing on you. And in that case, it's like, all right, time to go. Yeah, I, I and I have agree. like the the ever the advertising agency that I was at before I went to Hallmark. You know, I had some really great chapters there, and I was there for two years, and a lot of the time I was pretty happy, but there were just some changes in the way management was handling stuff and the leadership in the company, and it really felt like the dread of dealing with the politics and the drama was outweighing the pleasure we got from my job and some of the fringe benefits. So I was on the philanthropy committee, and you know, was involved in all of these like company culture things, but superficial company culture things didn't matter if I was dreading literally every meeting I had with upper management. When you have that dreading feeling every day, it's time to go. Bingo. I used to be... Then I went to Hallmark and now I'm here. Right. (laughs) It's... Okay, I used to work for, for Baltimore City as a teacher. And I love teaching, and I love education. I hated working for Baltimore City. I will never, ever recommend that anyone ever work for Baltimore City. It was. I don't want. To, I don't. I don't have a. It was. Imagine you had a um, a guillotine, but it was an emotional guillotine of stress and unrealistic expectations and convoluted nonsense. That's what it was, and. I remember feeling guilty. I wanted to stop teaching. I'm like, no, I have to, I have to, I have my students, and I'm going to have them again next year. It looks like, and I, how can I leave? But at the end of the day, it was better for me. I was miserable. It was affecting me psychologically. It was affecting my mood. It was affecting. It was affecting everything, and I had that feeling of, I hate going to work every single day. It sucks. And yep. it's, it's time to go, no matter what, no matter. All the other considerations, I mean, obviously, in, in, in a vacuum, there are always other considerations. Like, if you're going to starve and you won't have any money after, if you quit, then you should probably find another job first. But all things being equal, it's just not worth it. It's not worth you. Yeah. And, you know, to, to bring it full circle, you know, your job is what pays for the rest of life. And I recognize that there's a lot of situations where people don't necessarily have the, the ability to leave the job they're in. But at the same time, like, 
your job isn't who you are. Your job isn't the value you put into the world necessarily. Um, your job is the means to build the rest of your life. And if you can't leave, set up new boundaries or institute new self-care methods or take some time to, to think about, you know, what, what about me can I care for or invest in to make this more tolerable while I'm here? Um, there, are, there are ways to, to make it work, but ultimately, like, you don't have to, to drive yourself crazy over a job you don't love if you don't need it. Right. Yeah, don't starve. That's don't, not a good idea. Um, I wanted just to sort of to end off, um, which we're just running out of time, but um, thinking about what we talked about and thinking about the SEO community, what changes would you like to see from within the community when it comes to these sort of issues, whether, whether it be um, balancing work better or, or being more accepting of these issues, whatever it is, what would you like to see from the industry? That's an awesome question. I think I can proudly say that the SEO space is probably one of the more open and candid ones, at least like the Twitter circles we tend to run in. Yeah, I, I found that as well. Are, yeah, I, I feel like there's a lot of people that are very open about like, hey, we're these analytical and creative geniuses that are renaissance people because we have to be and oh by the way we're all a little bit messed up in our head <laughs> so let's all be let's all be cool and nice to each other <laughs> by the uh, way everybody is a little bit messed up in the head that's just how it goes oh, no one sure. to quote jim for morrison sure. no one here gets out alive bingo um but i do feel like you know because our, our trade does tend to, to attract people that have to use their whole brain um you, I do feel like you tend to see a little bit more openness. That said, I would love to see it discussed more at some of the highest levels of the industry. You don't really see panel discussions about mental health and SEO at Search Engine World. <laughs> um, it's, you know, these these conversations are happening on Twitter in small scale or they're happening in search engine journal on their focus Fridays. Like I would love to see some of the biggest speakers in, in the SEO space and some of the biggest conferences and industry leaders really being open about like, Hey, how many people in this room are also taking antidepressants because we're all struggling with something. Um, you know, I've, I've yet to go to a digital conference and feel like, the mental and emotional strain of what we do is adequately addressed. It's all jokes about, oh, we have to drink so much coffee and we work crazy hours <laughs> and we were crazy for signing out to do this job that we have zero power over. But ultimately, like, you got to just address it. And, you know, a few influencers on Twitter being open to talking about it doesn't have necessarily the same influence as maybe a keynote at an SEO conference discussing the importance of caring for the SEO strategist. Yeah. That's just it. I like that. Let's make that happen somehow. So, uh, what was that? We should make that happen somehow. Uh, yeah, maybe. Although, you know, I'm living that startup life. I don't think I'm really going to be... <laughs> yes. uh, I'm not, I'm not going to be going to a lot of expensive conferences. <laughs> <laughs> well, Kelly, we're out of time. Um, I just want to say thank you for, for sharing everything that you've shared. I, I honestly, I, I admired you um, for, for sharing, having the courage to share. It's not, it's not always easy to put yourself out there like that. And um, I just really appreciate it. Thank you. Well, thank you for having me, Marty. This has been amazing. And, you know, it says a lot about your character and your commitment to our community that you're willing to reach out and find people that, to have some of these tough conversations with. So thank you so much for what you do for the SEO industry. It's my pleasure. Thank you again. Yep. Bye-bye. Thank you. 
And we are back to your regularly scheduled in search SEO podcast. Oh, I, I, I meant to mention this before. Um, we're not doing the news today. Mm. And that actually has nothing to do with the uh, the formatting of this of, of the show and the serious issue we just addressed. The news will be back next week. We're actually recording a bit early. Okay. Um, I have to take a few days off, actually a day and a half, which for my schedule being packed the way it is means like it's like the equivalent of being off for a week. I feel like I'm very stressed out about being off for a day and a half. Mm-hmm. It's freaking me out. Like I have to watch my kids for half a day. It's a whole long story, whatever. Okay. Yeah, so I have to take a, a day for myself or something mm-hmm. and then another half a day. You don't care. I'm just telling you, <laughs> I'm stressed out. It's, it's impacting my mental health. Um, yeah. Anyway, like I, I had strep like, what, like a week and a half, two weeks ago. I work, no one even knew. I just like work through it. Like I just work. Oh. Yeah. See, I just work. Um, so it's like stressful for me to take a day off, which is probably not good for my work-life balance. Right. So I need to be, I need to be better at that, which I actually do need to be better at that. So no news this so, week. So yeah, what I'm trying to say is there's no news <laughs> yeah. because we're, we're, we're recording way early and there's no sense in covering news that didn't happen yet or right. that should be impossible or news that's like way irrelevant at this point that by the time you're hearing this. So we're just not doing it. So that's that. Also, due to the serious nature of today's show, we will not be doing a fun SEO send-off question because that's obviously inappropriate. So that will be back again next week when our regular um, peculiar format is back. Mm -hmm. Hyper energetic, hyper frantic maybe. (laughs) Hyper fun in my opinion. So rather than, you know, just end off now, which I think it's kind of like weird, like are we going to end off now? Goodbye. No. Uh, let's tie it all up, baby. I'll ask a, a, a reflective SEO question okay. instead of the fun SEO send-off question. A reflective SEO send-off question. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And we'll put this out there on Twitter maybe to, you know, when we, when we promote this episode. Maybe we'll get some of the community's feedback on this because I think it's something the community needs to be involved in. Right. So here we go, okay? Mm-hmm. So our reflective question this week will be, what needs to change for the SEO industry to better promote mental health? Oh wow! Do you want to do you want to take this one first? Uh, well, o- honestly, I uh, I don't know. I feel like I'm not really qualified to answer such question. I'm not a, an expert on the subject, and I, I just I think I would re- rather you know just sit this one out and listen to you and what you have to say, and maybe read more about it and uh, get educated on the subject. To be honest. Oh, I mean, I respect that very much. Yeah. And that's a really honest thing to do. I mean, I personally think that you are very much qualified to answer that question. Oh, thank you. But I will respect your decision not to weigh in. Um, what do you have? What What do you think? I think a lot of things. I have to watch my tongue with this one, I think. Oh, okay. Um, I think Twitter needs to change a bit within the SEO sphere. I think that sometimes when opinions are expressed that we may disagree with or that we may think are stupid... And they may actually be stupid. Mm. Uh, we don't do a good job recognizing the other person's perspective or the fact that the other person's a human being in cases where they, what they're saying makes no sense. Let's like run through the two possibilities, right? One, what they're saying does kind of make sense, but I disagree. It's okay to disagree. Right. It's a question of how do you disagree? Like you're, you're going to go out there, you're going to talk about SEO on Twitter, you're going to tweet a lot about SEO, you're going to run into people that you disagree with. It's sort of like a marriage. You are, you know, someone that gets married or, or you know, um, whatever, uh, is in a relationship, you don't have to be married for this to apply. You're going to think, like, you're, you're not going to fight with your spouse or significant other, your partner. Like, you are. Whether you're dating for a long time or you're actually married or whatever it is. You're casual friends, even. You're going to fight with people. Right. To walk around thinking that you're not going to get into arguments, disagreements, or fights with people is silly. We're an aggressive species as humans, it's more about how you deal with it, right? How do you argue? How do you argue? What is your language when you argue? Mm. What's your tone when you argue? And just because you disagree with somebody, you know, if they have a valid opinion, so recognize that. Okay, I might think, just to go throw an example out there, that all the core updates are about technical issues, like uh, links and, and speed and, and whatever. Or no, I personally think that, you know, it's more far more holistic than that. It's about language use and tone and formatting and UI and UX. We have a disagreement. I personally hold by the latter, but I understand why a person would think that technical SEO is behind the core updates. I'm sure you can find patterns that would indicate that. And while I can, I'll lay up my case for that 
and I'll I'll walk you through why I think what you are saying isn't correct. Doesn't mean I need, I need to disrespect you. At the same time, even though I think you're wrong. Right. Right? Now let's run to the other scenario. What you're saying is clearly wrong. Right? Google um, counts um, H1 headers as like the most important thing in the whole world of SEO. Uh, objectively speaking, not true. Right. Okay? It doesn't mean that the other person behind the keyboard typing into Twitter is, is, is an ass. I mean, they might be. But it doesn't mean that intrinsically. Right. Right, they're a person, and you might you might know more about SEO than they do, but they're still a person. Like what you came out of the womb as an SEO expert. What did I have, doctor? Um, it's a girl, and an SEO expert. <laughs> Come on, there's a point where you were also ignorant, right? It's a funny thing about knowledge. Like knowledge um, is one of those things that we get very egotistical about. I know more than you, therefore I'm better than you. Though that's a that's a totally artificial equation. Human worth is not defined by knowledge. Right? If, if that were the case, we would throw babies in the garbage because they know nothing. Mm. So that's clearly silly. But for some reason, and it's not, I've been in many knowledge communities before, in education, in theology, but all these different communities. It's one consistent thing about all knowledge-based communities that not, they, many people in those communities take knowledge to be an existential value. Now I am better because I know more and that's a false equation. Mm. So even if you think the guy or the gal who wrote whatever it is on Twitter is a moron, it doesn't mean you should say that right. because you still have to respect their foundational humanity. So I think we need to be a little bit better than either scenario. Either we disagree with you and I think you're wrong or that's clearly, objectively speaking, wrong, but how do I deal with you as a person? And I think we need to be better at that. At all levels, from from us, the SEOs, to, to Google, to the publications, everybody. Except for Barry Schwartz. He's perfect. <laughs> but everybody else. Like, if you ever stuck it, what do I do? Just wonder, what would Barry do? <laughs> and it'll probably be the opposite of what you would do. <laughs> and uh, I think that's it. I think that's all I got. Huh. Yeah. So um, thank you for tuning in. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to express this issue, deal with this issue, take this issue up. It's very important to me. I think it's very important to all of us. And I appreciate you taking the time out of your day to listen to and... Um, validate this discussion that said we're back to our regular fun format next week all new episode of the in search seo podcast coming at you um next tuesday so look forward on the rank ranger blog and stitcher on spotify and soundcloud and wherever great podcasts are found and um thank you again for tuning in until then it's been in search because we're all in search of something, of something. toodles <laughs>